Hello, my name is Andrew Fake from Minds and Money, and delighted to be joined today by Travis McPherson of NextGen Energy. Delighted to have you with us today on the show, Travis. Yeah, thanks, Andrew, and thanks to Minds and Money and Red Cloud for uh, for hosting this. This is excellent. We're excited. Well, um, as an opening question, um, uranium. Why should investors be looking to uranium in two thousand and twenty three? Yeah, it's a good question. And look, uranium is something very uniquely that can actually address the three largest challenges that the globe has today and really will have for, you know, our kids generations probably, which is decarbonization, which I think everyone understands, um energy security, which has become of the utmost importance obviously over the last 18 months uh since the invasion of the Ukraine. Um and then access to power. So addressing energy poverty, those three things, nothing can address those three things like clean baseload nuclear power, which is obviously generated um, as a result of mining uranium. So we've also come out of a, a very long bear market um, in the uranium industry. And as a result of that, um, there's just been an, a massive underinvestment in the uranium mining space. Um, you know, incentive prices even today are well below, uh, or, or sorry, spot prices are well below uh, incentive pricing for existing production, let alone for new mines to come into production. So that has already all happened. So from an investor's point of view, looking at the space, all the tough legwork's already been done in the industry in the sense of all the inventory drawdowns, all the secondary sources, all the um, stuff that comes with a really deep, long bear market that's behind us. And in front of us now, um, is a demand picture because of those three challenges that the whole world is getting behind in a very meaningful way now. Um, demand is extremely robust, much more robust than it's ever been in the nuclear industry's history. And then from a supply perspective, because of that bear market, we don't have the ability as an industry to respond anytime soon. So the result will obviously be very long, uh, a sustained period of very high uranium prices as the industry tries to incentivize new production to come online, which is very much needed. I will add to that also that along with energy security of the generation of power, also similarly and kind of tangential to that is the um, supply chains. And so, you know, you have a very, over the last 10 years, you've had a very uh, concentrated period of uranium production where, you know, 15 years ago, let's say the world was getting uranium from, from everywhere. There was lots of places in the world and there wasn't one area that was very um, jurisdictionally concentrated. Over the last 10 years, as a result of this bear market, it got really concentrated in um, Kazakhstan, Russia kind of area. Um, and so the world will also need to diversify that supply chain for a number of reasons. Um, and so having uh, new mines coming out of Canada, as an example, or Australia, which are historic uranium producers, is going to be very, very important and very much um, uh, valuable going forward. And the great thing about Next Gen Energy is that you're based in Canada. Can you tell us a little bit about your company and about the project? Yeah, so we're, look, our focus is to deliver the clean energy fuel for the future. Um, and it really, we're very, every decision we make and everything we do is focused on how do we optimally advance this project to address those three major challenges that the world faces. Um, we are developing what will what is capable of being the world's largest low-cost uranium producer. As you said, in Saskatchewan, Canada, which is uh, consistently ranked as the world's best mining jurisdiction and definitely the best uranium mining jurisdiction. It's an absolute pleasure working in that, in that province and in Canada, frankly. Um, we're at the um, in the final stages of our permitting process, and we're into detailed engineering. Um, so the project is really advanced. Um, we're going to be starting um, procuring pieces of equipment this year. So, you know, we're again we made the discovery ourselves back in 2014. So from an investor coming into the space now, it's a great time to be looking at next gen for that reason. We've again done a lot of the legwork. We've defined, found a deposit, defined it. Um, advanced it through PEA, PFS, FS, and now we're into the kind of execution phase of the project. So really, really exciting. Um, and yeah, if there's, 
you know, if there's a, if, if you've heard the term like world-class or tier one project, this is uh, at the top of that list, frankly, it is an absolute freak deposit. It's extremely high grade. It's incompetent basement rock with no surface or, or underground water to deal with. Um, we've got huge community stakeholder support for this project. We've got buy-in from all the, all of the, um, political environments as well, again, as they try to address these three major challenges. So it's a great, uh, it's a great story and very advanced. And you have a team behind it that is extremely committed to um, advancing this project optimally and in the benefit of all of our stakeholders. You just uh, mentioned your team briefly there. You're the chief commercial uh, officer. Can you tell us a little bit about the, your CEO and the, and the key uh, management personnel? Yeah, so Lee Courier is our, our founder and CEO. Um, he is uh, only been in uranium, frankly, since he started in the industry in 2002. So he's seen multiple cycles um, in the uranium industry. Um, and he founded the company, as I mentioned, and uh, and made the discovery back in 2014 with, with the team. There we have um, a number of other people on the board. Um, with deep, deep uranium mining experience, and importantly, also non-uranium mining experience, because Aero, our project, is unique in the sense that this is the first time really in uranium history where you haven't had something unique to uranium to deal with with this project. This project is much more analogous to uh, underground gold mine than it is you know, a conventional uranium mine, both either in Canada or abroad. So having a mix of those experiences is very important. Um, we've got Kevin Small as our, as our uh, Senior Vice President of Projects, a very experienced shaft sinker um, in this kind of a, a technical setting. And then we've got a slew of um, absolute A-grade people across the team. Um, so we've got the team in place to, to execute this project, frankly. It's it's all in-house already. So great and time. And you're also backed by um, a... <clears throat> Fantastic um, uh, shareholders as well. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your key investors? Yeah, yeah. So our largest investor is uh, Li Ka Shing's group out of out of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, very, very uh, supportive uh, shareholders that group is. Um, we also have Queens Road Capital, um, which is led by Warren Gilman, who's on our board, been been on our board, and been involved with the company for a very long time. Um, he, they're also a very large supportive shareholder. With those two investments, actually, um, the company management and the board holds the voting shares uh, and voting uh, rights to those shares. Um, so collectively, they own about 22% of the company. Um, so very, very supportive. Don Roberts from the uh, from Lee Cushing's group is also on our board. Um, and uh, and then we have, you know, as, as I said, really a, a who's who of... Um, of uh, investors, A-grade A investors, both mining specialists and also others. It's probably about two thirds uh, institutionally held and, and the balance in retail, um, very liquid. You know, we trade, we're listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, and also the Australian Stock Exchange. And globally, we trade about $40 million a day, Canadian. Mm -hmm. So um, what's on the horizon for the next six to 18 months for, uh... Next gen energy. Yeah, so it's really all about executing the project and really starting the construction phase. Um, caveat being, we do need our permits in order to to do that. But over the next eighteen months, that's that's definitely possible. Um, you know, we finished the um, public comment period through the permitting process as well as technical comments. So we've got all of those in hand. We're in the process of responding to those, and we'll respond to those uh, very near term. Uh, and then really, it's about, uh, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're not a company, there's no question in our minds whether we're going to get permitted, we just don't know exactly when we're going to get permitted. Um, but we do know it's it's coming pretty quickly, given where we're, how advanced the project is. And so we're, we're really working on project development, as I mentioned, so detailed engineering and procurement in parallel with as we finalize the permitting process. So we'll be ready to start shaft sinking by the end of this year. We won't be able to start shaft sinking, obviously, until we have our permits. But, um, you know, that again, that's a possibility that we do have those permits by then.
Mm -hmm. And one final question. Um, I get the decarbonisation argument as do a lot of institutional investors. If when I talk to retail investors, they have one block about investing into uranium, it's the safety block that they have. They just don't see uranium or see nuclear plants as being safe. Um, what would you say to that? Well, I'd say a couple of things. One, it's statistically the safest form of electricity generation known to man. That, that's a fact. So the the, the fear of of that is kind of similar to the fear of people have of you know getting eaten by a shark or getting hit by lightning or dying in a plane crash. You, you know, it's very statistically improbable, but I understand it's quite a motive for people. Near like I, I would say probably the best example, frankly, is what's just gone on in the Ukraine where there's a nuclear power plant operating in the middle of a war zone, literally being bombed, power being cut off to it. And that just demonstrate, and that, and there was no risk of any kind of meltdown there. I think that really highlights and should highlight to investors that, wow, this really is the safest. We don't want that to be the example. We don't want it to have to come to that for people to realize that it's very, very safe. But I'm saying that that is a great demonstration of how safe these plants are. Um, so totally understand the emotive element, but the reality is it's by far the safest. And, you know, when you look at all your options, not only is it the safest, but it's by far the most efficient form of uh, generation on a full life cycle basis. So um, it's an absolute necessity. I think if you look around the world at policymakers and thought leaders, everyone is saying the same thing, which is that if we are going to get to net zero by any date, there's no way of achieving that without a material investment in nuclear. It's not to say that, you know, it's only nuclear, it's going to be nuclear, it's going to be renewables, all of that, but nuclear has to play a critical role. And frankly, if you're not for nuclear, it means you're for coal or you're for gas. So, you know, you have to make a choice there. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Travis. We do wish Next Gen Energy all the best for 2023 and uh, hope to see you again on Minds and Money TV again soon. Um, this interview was brought to you in association with Red Cloud. Thank you very much for your time. Travis McPherson, Chief Commercial Officer of Next Gen Energy. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And again, thanks to everyone listening and thanks to Minds and Money and Red Cloud. Really appreciate it. And we will be back on soon. Thank you.